and I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I hope you'll get some value out of this lecture today. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an approach to workshop, um, a way to think about workshop, and then we'll talk specifically about what to do before, during, and after workshop. Does that sound okay to you? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So, why this topic? Why do a lecture on workshop? I remember during my first residency, standing outside Noble Hall after workshop, talking to a friend when a student from my workshop joined us and asked if I'd seen the student whose story we had just discussed. No, why, I asked. I just wanted to make sure she's okay. She was crying. She was crying? My mind just immediately went to this moment in first grade, me sitting behind Charlotte Schwartz, who had amazing blonde hair, and she turned around with these enormous blue eyes, and she had tears in her eyes, and she told me that the boy in front of her said the picture she was drawing was ugly. And I specifically remember being disturbed by this, because I was certain the boy had said this for no other reason than to be mean. Of course, he was probably offering a particular criticism on the validity of her art, but I was only six, okay. and this just struck me as plain wrong. Uh, okay, I have a confession to make. Uh, there was a reason that Charlotte turned to me, and that's because I already had a reputation for being a defender. I didn't like kids being unkind. I didn't like kids getting picked on. And though I have no specific memory of it, it is highly likely that this boy and I, later that day, had an encounter on the playground um, <laughs> that would make him think twice before offering unhelpful criticism again. <laughs> okay, I abhor violence now, but back then, when I was six, hitting was efficient and effective. <laughs> In the classroom, though, I just said to Charlotte, you tell him your picture is just fine. It's a nice picture. Now this childhood instinct of mine is still here. And when I heard the student from workshop was crying, my heart wanted to go to that place of jumping in there and defending her and her writing and, and just say, you tell them your story is just fine. It's a good story. Now my head was saying, well, wait a minute. Yes, it was a good story. And we had a vigorous discussion. But there's nothing mean-spirited about it. Most of the comments were interesting and useful, so why was she crying? And honestly, I can never know for certain why she was crying. I could have been the one who said something that made her cry. She could have been relieved the workshop was over, who knows? Whatever the case, she was having an emotional response to what went on in that classroom at that time. And I kept thinking the situation didn't have to happen. And I didn't know how to convey that to her. I didn't know what to say in a way that would be comfort comforting or helpful to her. So I didn't do anything. But the event stayed on my mind through the rest of my residencies here because it kept coming back again and again in different versions. Once or twice more, I heard about writers crying after their workshops. But more my, my more frequent experience involved um, conversations in which fellow writers uh, they would talk, sometimes seriously, sometimes joking, but I think in the kind of joking that bears true about being anxious, tense, and concerned about workshop. Now, I, I tried to ignore it. I thought this kind of fear was like a fly. I figured most writers just swatted away long enough to get something written. A workshop can be an annoyance, to be sure, but it's not a life and death matter. However, I've come to see that how we go into workshop can become a life and death matter in terms of the survival of our writing lives. And here's what I mean. Nancy Slonim Irony is the author of the book Writing from the Heart, and she's the director of the Chilmark Writing Workshop on Martha's Vineyard. Now Nancy is in her 60s, she's been writing a long time. She used to do commentaries for National Public Radio, she's taught at Harvard, she lectures on writing all over the I met her just this past February 
at an event where she was the keynote speaker. And during her talk, she told the story of how at one point in her career, when she lived in Connecticut, she was invited to join a writer's circle, an ongoing workshop of writers known and unknown, as she described it. The group itself was well known, and Nancy was excited to have the opportunity to work with them. She talked about going to this gorgeous house for her first meeting, where she and the other writers were served a marvelous peach cobbler. <laughs> Nancy likes food. And they discussed one of the writer's short stories. Now, Nancy thought the story was one of the most beautiful pieces of writing she'd ever read, but no one in the room said a positive thing about it. They ripped it to shreds with one woman even commenting in a kind of tight, lock-jawed voice. She said, oh, Sally, you just don't give up, do you? <laughs> so Nancy went home and she told her husband two things. The peach cobbler was the best she'd ever had, and these writers all just gave horrible feedback. Are you going back, he asked. She said, yes. At the next meeting, Nancy found herself at another gorgeous Connecticut home where she ate wonderful blueberry scones <laughs> and listened as she heard another excellent story torn apart in their discussion. Nancy was stunned. And she returned with a similar report for her husband. Terrible workshop, but I loved the scones. <laughs> Are you going back? She said yes. <laughs> the third time she went, it was Nancy's turn to have a story critique. Now she arrived at the host's well-appointed home, and she sat with a legal pad on her lap. And she listened, she nodded, and she took pages and pages of notes. And she told us, she said to herself, uh-huh, uh-huh. Wow, I had no idea this story was such a piece of crap. <laughs> and, and we laughed, we laughed when Nancy told us this story. And I expect Nancy to tell us something absolutely heroic. You know, I thought that maybe she shredded her notes in their faces and just stalked out. Um, maybe she told them that they didn't know a good thing, of, uh, a thing about good writing, right? At the very least, I thought she was going to say she knew not to take the group too seriously. But that's not what happened. Afterwards, Nancy said when the discussion was over and this fabulous apple crisp was served, she took her apple crisp and left, and she went to her car. And she sat in that car, and she tried to eat the dessert. But she was so upset, she couldn't swallow. Nancy went home and didn't write again for two years. She lost two years of her writing life, despite knowing how bad this group was, despite knowing she was about to receive the hatchet job of a lifetime. To me, that's unacceptable and a terrible, terrible waste of time and talent. Now, this example is extreme, but on the smallest, smallest chance that such a result can come of any workshop, I just felt I would be remiss if I graduated and left this campus without doing something, however small, to alleviate the issue of workshop anxiety. Our workshops here, at least in my experience, are not vicious or competitive, but they are rigorous and helpful, but you must prepare for the rigor as you would for any vigorous activity. And we're going to talk about how to do that, how to be prepared. And by the way, I say this for everyone in the room, but especially for the advisors, I will not be accosting anyone on the playground after workshop. <laughs> <laughs> You're all safe from me. So what is workshop? I'm going to quote a few essays from writers reflecting on the workshop experience. Uh, you have these quotes in your handouts if you want to read more about this um, from the source material. Some of them pertain to workshops in general, some to undergraduate workshops, some to full-time MFA programs. Personally, my only experience of formal workshop has been at BCFA, so my discussion will relate specifically to what we do here. And although I hope, um, I hope you can take some of this into your own writing life um, in whatever form you find to continue it after you graduate. Now, the discussion of whether or not creative writing can be taught and whether workshops are helpful or harmful to the creative process has been an active one for years. Does the pedagogy of workshop work? Is it the most effective way to teach creative writing? On the one side, we have writers such as Anis Shivani, author of Against the Workshop, Provocations, Polemics, Controversies. 
in a 2011 essay for a symposium on can creative writing really be taught in the literary journal Boulevard, he wrote, the psychology of the workshop has not yet been thoroughly explored. It is a mild form of hazing, an officially sanctioned sadism in which students eagerly participate. The student sits quietly while his work is read in front of him, not allowed to intervene as peers shred his work or occasionally praise it. All kinds of political, gender, class, and racial subtext pervade such peer-to-peer -peer critique. Those criticizing are as ignorant of the art of writing as those whose work is being discussed. They're picking up cues from the instructor as to what is acceptable or not acceptable. John Gardner is representative of those who see the favorable view of workshop. In On Becoming a Novelist, he wrote, it is true that most writers' workshops have faults. <coughs> Nevertheless, a relatively good writers' workshop can be beneficial. Being with a group of serious writers at one's own stage of development makes the young writer feel less a freak than he might otherwise. And talking with other writers, looking at their work, listening to their comments can abbreviate the apprenticeship process. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that after the beginning stages, a writer needs social and psychological support. Now, I doubt this debate will ever go away, but one feature will never change. There will always be a writer seeking to learn. And this writer will often find herself in a group, whether inside or outside of academia, as she searches to improve her craft. However, very little of what I read for this lecture, actually, John Gardner was a bit of an exception, spoke about workshop from the point of view of the writer in terms of thinking about the experience the writer wants for herself out of workshop. What does that person hope to learn? How does she listen? How does she think about a critique? It seems students are just supposed to show up and, and wait to be acted upon by whatever theory the teacher in charge presents. Maybe these essays don't address this because they know on a certain level it can paint the whole workshop good or bad issue with a tinge of irrelevancy. A proactive writer will take what she can from workshop, good or bad, and move on. Which means the debaters can go on debating, and they will for years to come. I guess what I'm saying is that workshop is not going to change, but you can. You are here now, and you can better understand what's going on with, with your writing, and what you might need to improve it, and what kind of workshop experience you hope to have. But you have to take ownership of both your writing and your learning process and be confident enough to assess and assert yourself consistently. In his essay, An Invitation to the Reader, in the book, You Must Revise Your Life, the poet William Stafford wrote, becoming a writer is just partly the learning of tricks and processes of language. Literature comes about by way of a behavior, a way of thinking, a tendency of mind and feeling. We can all learn technique and then improvise pieces of writing again and again, but without a certain security of character, we cannot sustain the vision, the trajectory of significant creation. We can learn and know and still not understand. Perceiving the need for that security of character is not enough. You have to possess it, and it is a gift or something like a gift. Now, what does Stafford mean by security of character? I take this to mean a certain understanding of one's work and a willingness to put aside or temporarily suppress our personality foibles for the sake of the work. This doesn't mean confidence, although confidence in the right, in, in the right doses always helps. And this goes beyond trying not to take a critique too personally. We sometimes say, oh, she's taking this personally. But I think that's an oversimplification of the matter, because there can be many things brewing in any particular emotional mix. Doubt about one's talent, being overwhelmed at the prospect of what to do with all the workshop commentary, or just plain run-of-the-mill fear. What we're doing here today won't cure all of this, but I'm hoping you will be able to put the stew on the back burner, at least for a little while, for the benefit of the writing at hand. So, the approach. Let's begin by dispensing with the image of the workshop as a torture chamber. 
or a hazing situation. Okay. I prefer the poet Donald Hall's metaphor that compares workshop to a garage. In the book, Breakfast Served Any Time All Day, Essays on Poetry New and Selected, he writes, the poetry workshop resembles a garage to which we bring incomplete or malfunctioning homemade machines for diagnosis and repair. Here is the homemade airplane for which the crazed inventor forgot to provide wings. Here is the internal combustion engine, all finished except that it lacks a carburetor. Here is the rowboat without oar locks, the ladder without rungs, the motorcycle without wheels. We advance our non-functional machine into a circle of other apprentice, apprentice inventors and one or two senior Edisons. Very, very good, they say. It almost flies. How about, uh, how about wings? <laughs> or let me show you how to build a carburetor. Okay. Uh, this metaphor spoke to me because this is how I've always spoken about my first published novel. And, and some of you have heard me say this, that that book felt like an airplane I built all by myself in my garage. Yes, it worked. It flew. But I knew for my writing to get any better, I needed to bring more writers into the garage. Perhaps some who knew about jet engines, or some who could show me how to build a time machine, because I wanted to work on historical fiction. I also like this meta metaphor because it's not intimidating, and it smacks of potential. This garage, <coughs> your workshop, is filled with a tremendous opportunity for you to see your writing in ways that will be difficult for you to do on your own. John Gardner wrote, often class criticism can show the writer that he has, at some specific point, written misleadingly or has failed to evoke some important element of a scene. Mistakes the writer could not catch himself because, knowing what he intended, he thinks his sentences say more than they do. He may imagine, for instance, that the bulge in his female character's coat clearly indicates that she is carrying a gun, whereas a listener not privy to the writer's mental image may imagine that the woman is pregnant. <laughs> Seeing the effects of his mistakes makes the writer more careful, more wary of the trickery words are capable of. The wide range of opinion a class affords increases the writer's chance of getting a fair hearing. And the focus of the whole class on the writer's work increases the odds that most of his mistakes or ineffective strategies will be noticed. When you bring a piece and invention into the garage, you do so because you've taken it as far as you can on your own. You've bumped up against your own limitations or you've run out of ideas. In workshop, there's a chance you'll get to overcome these difficulties. And already, that will allow you to walk into the garage with a kind of hopeful expectation. That's cause for excitement, even nervousness, but it doesn't have to be fear. But in order for you to feel this hopefulness and to get the most benefit out of the workshop experience, you have to be proactive about the way you think about your writing. I believe some of the fear around workshop comes from feeling that one is passive and has no power in workshop you are being acted upon. But if you prepare your work and prepare your mind, you'll find yourself having a more productive and perhaps even enjoyable experience. Your hope can be realized. So before workshop, what's the first thing that happens before workshop when we're getting ready to come here? We get that email, right, from Jericho? That email that, that is all about making your submission for prose writers, it could be no more than 20 pages, double spaced, and you can submit work from your application manuscript, semester work, or new material. That's what it says. But how do you choose, right? The email says nothing about that, right? You don't want to submit something that's completely done, meaning you've gone through a number of revisions and the piece is ready to be sent out and possibly published. You definitely don't want to submit something that's already been accepted for publication, as tempting as that may be. A, a teacher once told me that when a student does that, she's totally acting out of fear, huge fear. And she wants to have that shield of being able to reply to any negative critique by saying, well, this is already going to be published. Which doesn't help the student as a writer, 
And it's disrespectful to fellow students who put in the time and effort of reading and providing feedback. On the other hand, you don't want to submit a rough, rough first draft. That can also be a waste of valuable critiquing time because a lot of the discussion might be spent on issues you probably would have figured out yourself in the course of one or two revisions. Ideally, you want to submit a piece that you've done some work on. It is very much in progress and you've taken it as far as you can for the moment. You have questions about the piece and you want to come to workshop with these questions in mind to help you focus on what you're seeking. If you haven't thought about this, and if you haven't been workshopped yet, I encourage you to go back and reread the piece that you've submitted for workshop to generate your questions. So for example, you might ask yourself, what am I trying to do with this piece? This question will keep you focused on your result, the result you want. Otherwise, you could get sidetracked by feedback that will lead you to imitate something that isn't you. Where did I struggle? If you're already unhappy about the piece, articulate as much as possible why, and then be glad because you're going to get help finding out how to work with the issue. Notice I didn't say fix it, okay? It's not always possible in workshop to come up with a fix. Um, some would say that that's not even the goal, but you should come away with some ideas of how to approach the issue, some new things to try. Uh, think about what are my favorite parts? And note that even after workshop, they can still be your favorite parts, no matter what is said about them. Don't take the opportunity to beat up on yourself. Is there a specific craft technique I'm using or would like to use but don't know how? Uh, by the way, there's another benefit to asking these kinds of questions before you submit your writing. It can help you cut the piece if you need to trim it down to those 20 pages. Um, I realized this when I wanted to submit a long essay for workshop a couple of residencies ago. And at first I was cutting, you know, wherever I could to get down to the 20 pages. But then as I looked at the structure of the essay again, I realized the sections were set up in such a way that I could remove sections without harming the gist of the story. Some of these sections I liked a lot. Others, I, I wasn't so sure of them. So it occurred to me that instead of cutting all the sections piecemeal, I could just delete some of the sections I liked and keep the parts where I most wanted feedback. You can't always do this. Some pieces just won't break down this way without harming the whole. But it's something that, to think about just to give you another option. In order to ask these questions, you want to know your strengths and weaknesses as a writer. If you do, then some of the criticisms you'll receive will not be new to you. Another reason not to take it personally. If you're being honest with yourself, you already know how confusing and unclear your metaphors can be. You already know how stingy you were with that character's development. Or you have a tendency to evoke settings that come off as engaging as great cardboard. You know all of this. Remember, you've come to the garage for some thoughts on how to work with these issues. At some point, you have to stand up for your own writing and understand your own voice. The writer Frank Wilson in Boulevard's, in, in Boulevard's symposium on can writing, creative writing really be taught, said someone else can teach you how to write like somebody else, but nobody can teach you how to write like yourself. For illustrative purposes, I'll share some of my writing issues with you. Um, by the way, Donald Hall said in his essay that lectures loud with moral advice are always self-addressed. The words I say to you here are also reminders to myself um, things that I tell myself over and over because I often forget and must relearn them. Uh, my characters can all sound the same. In the beginning, they are all some incarnation of me, but then they grow up and grow into their own voices. If I haven't spent enough time on a character or if I'm not careful, that process hasn't happened. Um, or I will just slip into my own voice while writing the character. The word manner once came up in the workshop um, pertaining to how a character sounded, and I immediately knew what that meant because that's how I can sound. It would be easy to take that personally, but the writer offering the critique didn't know me well enough to know that it was my voice that he's calling mannered. Yet he was astute in noticing that this was an issue. It's up to me to understand what it's about and not be upset. I, I actually have a friend 
um, who is a valued reader to me specifically because he knows exactly what I sound like, both in terms of speaking and on the page. And, and he will say very lovingly, he will point out um, in his notes, there's Sophronia. <laughs> but he's right. You know, he's usually dead on accurate. And I know I have to hit that revision. Uh, in rendering my dramatic scenes, I tend to hit the turbo melodrama button. I can't help it. I watch too many soap operas in my formative years. Um, my essays can sometimes seem as though I'm writing in a kind of shorthand. And by that, I mean I'm writing as though the reader already knows who I am and what's going on. Uh, this comes from writing letters. I, I write a lot of letters to people. And um, so I'm usually writing to someone who knows me well, and that tendency spills over into my CNF. I have to watch that. Sometimes my word choices aren't precise. And it's not that I don't care, but I'm so concerned with moving the plot along from point A to point B to point C, making sure it holds up and that it works, that I ignore the finer points. I usually get back to this in revision, but in a longer work, I may miss the opportunities to make a better choice. It really helps me to have someone else read and challenge me on those points. Okay, so now we're in workshop, during workshop. The gag rule is on. The class is discussing your piece, right? Knowing your strengths and weaknesses will provide you with a kind of buffer. You shouldn't be surprised if the issues you know well turn up in workshop, right? But let me caution you. You don't want to be in a mindset where you hear some of what you expected to hear and then stop listening because you've developed an attitude of, oh, I already knew that. I, I do that all the time. I already knew that. When you do that, you close yourself off to the listening, to the learning. You'll miss the opportunity to recognize and focus on a critique that could open your eyes to something new in your writing, good or bad. If you are clear and paying attention, you can ask yourself, is this critique true? What can I do with this information? What avenues has it opened for me to explore? Will it help me do what I'm seeking to do with the piece? How? You want to be constantly filtering the comments. If you have a general sense of what you're looking to learn, and if you're open-minded, it will be easier for you to tell what critique is helpful and what isn't. This is a free flow exchange of ideas, and your work is at the center of it. Really listen. Either ask someone to take notes for you, or only take notes when you hear something you know you want to do. But a side note, if you hear a comment that your plot or situation or scene isn't believable, and you want to respond with, but it really happened? Don't. <laughs> Such a response will not be helpful to you. Uh, Charles Baxter, in his essay on defamiliarization from the book Burning Down the House, writes, and the writer of this piece, wounded all over again by life, eventually says, but it really happened, or it's all true. Such a statement, and this is still Baxter, such a statement is unarguable but false to an experience of reading that concentrates on characters. It's like telling a bride on her wedding night that her spouse's body really consists of carbon molecules and hydrogen atoms and small subatomic particles such as quarks. It's true, but priggish and beside the point. The workshop readers can only address what is on the page, and if they are having trouble with believing it, then you have not communicated what really happened in a way that makes the story believable for them. That is the issue. Recognize it and ask questions that will help you understand what aspects make it unbelievable. You are seeking ideas so you can revise accordingly. <coughs> After workshops, okay, the work is not over. Be grateful for all the feedback, but know that you don't have to use every piece of it. I know you might be bewildered by the sheer volume of comments you receive. It's hard to know where to begin, and you might think you have to use it all simply because someone took the time to give it to you. You don't have to use it all. And if you think upfront about what will be helpful in terms of what you're trying to write, you will know how to choose and not make yourself crazy. It might help to write a note to yourself uh, with a brief narrative of what you heard and what you learned about the piece. You might even make a list of specific points you want to address, 
divided into what you can try right away and what you might want to consider after more thought. I encourage you to do this as soon as you can after workshop, either right after or that evening. You have to leave breadcrumbs for yourself because you might feel like you want to dump all the notes and comments on your desk when you get back to your room and not think about the piece or workshop again until after residency. But by then you'll either not want to look through the notes again because you fear being overwhelmed or you'll forget what was helpful, what your notes meant or what you wanted to do. You don't want to waste what you've learned, so write it down as soon as you can. And, and I will mention here that's a lesson that I've learned many, many years ago over and over again from my dear daddy, who was illiterate. My dad never learned how to read. And yet he was always pushing me and my siblings to write things down, write lists, especially when we went to the store. He would say, you people have to write things down because your mind is no good. <laughs> so I did, and I still do. I write things down. Also, you can write or rewrite according to the suggestions you receive, but you don't have to be wedded to the outcome of the revision that you do. Um, in my workshop, just this past residency, we spoke at length about whether I had revealed too much about a character too soon, and whether or not a particular part I described was truly indicative of his wealth and power, and his place in society. So I left that workshop with a mound of notes, and I wrote, I wrote a whole new chapter based on this new vision of my character. And it was not easy because I had to do some historical research. Uh, it involved Abbott's Field, the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Jackie Robinson crossing the color line in Major League Baseball in 1947. Now, the finished chapter had its pluses and minuses. It had some cool details and story, but the historic facts and the overall situation I created for my character didn't work with the rest of the book. This new material turned the character into someone else, and on top of that, suddenly I was writing a baseball novel, which was not what I intended to write. So despite spending a few weeks on this chapter, I got rid of it. But that's okay, because I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't made the attempt. You also have the option of doing nothing at all. If you are diligent in this process of knowing your work and preparing yourself before, during, and after workshop, you also find a kind of alchemy happening where the way you use workshop may change and your need for it may even lessen. When I was in Puerto Rico this past semester, we were discussing whether or not it helps to have a writing group after graduation. Some writers seem to require them, others don't. But if you don't think about your work in a proactive way, you put yourself in this situation where you're always waiting for approval or consensus before you make a change to your work. And uh, Mary Ruth will put it best. She said, the more you write, the more you will know to cross out that wrong line when you read it. And you won't wait until your writing group meets at 7.30 on a Tuesday <laughs> night for someone to tell you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. I have a wrap up here, but I'm going to stop right now and take Q&A before I do my wrap up. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, this is like, that's like, <laughs> yes. I agree. Would you, do you have some advice for the workshop members in terms of an orientation that, that fits with what you're saying? You know, somebody did that lecture, I think, in my second semester. And, I, and she had this wonderful chart about how to provide critique. And, and I said to Louise at the time, you should put this up and give it to everybody you go to. <laughs> I don't think she took that advice. <laughs> but, um, but I think that there are, there are, there's a big picture way to look at a story when you critique it, and then there's the fine line editing portion. I think it helps to, to look at both. Because when you write on the paper, the, the person you know wants to see those notes. I think in terms of the actual discussion in the workshop, it helps to think about the craft and the big picture discussion. So, um, and just now in workshop, you know, I, and you know because I covered this issue with you, um, Ellen, when we were working together. I I was wondering about the question of true omniscience versus close third person, and so I offered that up not just as a critique of the story, but as a question. Did the person make a clear choice? And, and is it, um, you know, what's going on here? So you think about it in terms of, of the craft and not just, it's easy to get caught up in the line by line editing, 
And then I think that makes it even harder to think about how you think about the story. But if we look at the big picture and, and pull back and, and think about choices and think about the bigger craft issues, I think that even takes a little pressure off the people doing the critiquing. They don't, they, there's that feeling, it's not like they have to be mean because they don't know what else to say. as much as it's maybe a comment that could lead into a question. Like two hours ago in my workshop, David Jowis was uh, sort of introducing like everybody and himself and um, him and Leanne were kind of talking about like the benefits of a workshop. And David said that one of the major benefits to his mind is that when you are critiquing other writers' work, you don't have the association with the work that might prevent you from be moving forward so a lot of times you can look at someone else's work, identify problems that you yourself have where you might not be able to see it in your own work, yes. and then you can translate that into action, forward action, um, with your own writing. So, I mean, are there, you know, you spoke a little bit about process in response to Ellen's question, but what about this sort of, like, overarching goal of, like, what's good for the group is good for the individual writer? I think what I like about what you said is that it goes back to the piece about understanding your own writing, right? Because you do have to understand your own strengths and weaknesses to, to see it, um, to see what someone else is trying to do. Um, I, I find that helps um, in reading as well, because we read novels by these great writers and we tend to think, oh, I can't do that, or this is so wonderful. But, and, and I think this is why we do critical papers, is because we want to understand what is it that we're trying to learn? And what does it look like on the page when it's being done well? You know, um, I totally agree with what um, Brett was talking about this morning about um, tearing apart, um, looking at good writing, typing it out. Sometimes I will write it out by hand because I need to know what it feels like coming out on the page. Um, but I also know what is it that I'm struggling with and, and I know which writers to go to, to to help me with that. You know, I mentioned my voice. To me, it's like a song. The things that I try to write have a certain tone, and I lose that tone sometimes. It's like I, I get tone deaf, and I have to go back and listen or read to some Zora Neale Hurston or Toni Morrison to get that sound in my ear again. Mm -hmm. and, and I would do the same in workshop. If I hear something that I know is a tone, like it rings for me, um, I, will, I will see that. I would be so excited to see that in, in workshop, and we're happy to point that out. You say that because I also have right I do that as well, but I also have writers I need to lose tone, right? So, oh, like, so okay. if I, like a palate know, cleanser, yeah, like a palate <laughs> 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 I think Tupula Hiri is good at that, like, she has a lyricism, but she doesn't affect the tone of her voice. Interesting, I like that. Thank you. Yes. I would like to think that, that there's a that your workshop leader is not part of the mess. You know, I would like to have confidence in, in workshop leader that, that one could go to that person and, and address these issues and, and work out some sort of specific strategy. Because I, um, although I know that, that teachers aren't all perfect, I, I'd like to believe that, that there is a leadership aspect if you are in a good workshop and that someone can help you address them. Yes, Liz. Liz and I are in a workshop together, but I think Clint did a great job today of talking about that, about what makes a helpful critique. Um, I didn't read anything specifically on that, but I do think um, workshop is an important help for that. Uh, I actually thought that my other thought about lecturing was going to be about how to write a book review. 
because I think that's something that we are not taught how to effectively review a book. And that's the same process, really, is, is reading something uh, with an eye towards craft and art, which is what we do in workshop. So I think um, perhaps not enough emphasis, maybe even at the undergraduate level, is put on that, um, because I think that, that you know, we could be raising the critics of our future without really thinking about it. Yes, anyone else? Okay, that means I get to go to my closing here. So, I'm going to end with a, another confession. Um, my motive in delivering this lecture is a little selfish. Uh, when I met Doug Glover my first semester, uh, and I was asking him about why people called him the Shredder, mm -hmm. I said, what, what is up with this? Why do, why do they call you this? And he said, what, what? You know, I, I just want my students to be serious about their writing. You know, I want the same. But I ask it not as a teacher, but as a reader. Um, I, I, if you don't continue to write and learn and be productive with your work, I don't get the chance to be changed by something you write. Every single one of you has a unique voice <coughs> and a very specific gift to give. And when you don't share what you have to offer to the world, we're the ones who are the lesser for it. I also say this because in my experience, I sometimes, you know, it's, it just helps to know that it's not all about you, right? There's a reader out there somewhere. That reader is waiting. You can get out of your head and get work done. And you must get the work done because if you don't put it out there, we can't receive it. And I'm going to end here with um, a Bruce Springsteen lyric because I, I love the boss, but I also think <laughs> that it's a wonderful expression of the potential that you have. May your strength give us strength. May your faith give us faith. May your hope give us hope. May your love bring us love. I want for you all to enjoy your workshops. I hope you're productive. I hope you'll be fearless. I know you can do it. Thank you.